it's heartbreaking to be here today to uh, to have to experience this again. A shattered piece in Regent Park. A shooting has left two men dead and a woman in hospital with serious but non-life-threatening injuries. Good evening. The community had recently celebrated going an entire year without seeing a single gun death. Police say two officers were also injured in a foot chase following the shooting. One person has been arrested in connection with the deadly incident. CTV Siobhan Morris has been following this investigation and joins us now live with more. Siobhan. Well, there's still so much we don't know about what did happen here in Regent Park. The people for whom this community is home desperately want to understand, and they say they're frustrated to find themselves mourning again. The horror played out in the afternoon sun, violence erupting around 1.30. Police were called to an area on Dundas just east of Parliament and a side street. thought something, a car sound over there, but like in three, four minutes, five to six police cars arrived here. That sound he heard, a single gunshot on Dundas where a male's life ended. Another male was pronounced dead in hospital. A female is being treated for non-life-threatening injuries. One person is in custody. The neighborhood's been safe for uh, the past you know, year or so, and it's getting better every day, so this is, this is shocking. Many neighbors say the violence involved members of the same family. In the last almost two years, we'd have, we've had zero gun deaths in Regent Park, and uh, that was something that we actually celebrated just a few weeks ago. The local councillor here to lend comfort. This community has gone through so much trauma over the last uh, many years since Regent Park has been here, and I thought, you know, we we're beyond this. But now there's mourning from fresh pains and reopened wounds. It's very alarming. In fact, um, I can't recall of uh, a shooting in broad daylight um, in, in years. Uh, so the fact that this is happening, especially during the month of Ramadan, uh, it's, it's sending, uh, it's, it's scaring folks. It's, it's almost chilling. Two police officers were also injured in what's being described as a foot chase. So you can see Dundas Street remains closed at this hour as police are continuing to build their investigation. There's still a lot of work to do. We do expect the police to be here for several hours yet tonight. We do hope to get a little bit more information from police, including what the relationship might have been between the people, uh, both who are deceased, the person that they have in custody. They have promised to give us an update at 7 o'clock. Reporting live, I'm Siobhan Morris. Nathan, back to you. Thank you, Siobhan. Well, two people are dead and two others were injured following a house fire in Mississauga early this morning. The Ontario Fire Marshal says a lack of working smoke alarms contributed to the deadly situation. CTV's Sean Lethong has been following the story. And, Sean, we're learning more about one of the people who was killed. Yes, a woman named Alice Cret in her late 70s. She was a grandmother, a mother living with her three adult children in the home. A very emotional scene a little while ago as a woman who did not want to appear on camera showed up identifying herself as the granddaughter, saying she grew up in the house behind and now she's seen what's going on inside. She's seeing the charred remains and is heartbroken. The charred remains inside a house where fire killed two people and injured two others. Neighbors and family identifying one of the victims as a resident for over 40 years named Alice Cret. My heart, number one, aches for Alice, and that's where all my thoughts are. Neighbor Jim Detien says he knew the victims well and that Alice lived with her two grown sons and daughter. He came outside early this morning to learn of his neighbor's death. Looked out the window, saw the fire trucks put two and two together. According to Peel Police, a 911 call came in at 3 o'clock this morning to the house on the corner of Bromsgrove Road and Winston Churchill Boulevard in Mississauga. Overnight, all I uh, noticed was a smell. Just the, all the fire trucks and the police cars and I didn't see any flames. I didn't see a fire. There was a lot of senior firefighters here on scene today, so they've seen a lot of fires and this was significant in terms of the heat conditions. It was initially reported by Mississauga Fire that there were multiple points of origin, but the Ontario Fire Marshal's office says further investigation has changed that finding. We're still doing the investigation, but right now there's nothing to indicate that it's a suspicious fire. As investigators worked through the day, heavy damage could be seen on the main floor. OFM saying they believe the fire started in the living room, spreading to the basement. As of yet, we have not found any evidence of any working smoke alarms. Fire crews saying that the two injured persons, a man and a woman, managed to get out on their own. 
The two deceased were found upstairs, where the OFM says there was no fire but heavy smoke damage, pointing to the lack of smoke alarms. In fatal fires, it's very common. That's why people don't get out. If they had working smoke alarms, they'd have adequate uh, warning that there's a fire and they'd be able to get out. Police also confirming that a deceased dog was found inside the home. Both the Ontario Fire Marshal's Office and Peel Police continue to investigate. So representatives from the OFM has just left a little while ago. They said they will be back tomorrow for further investigation. Reporting live, I'm Sean Lethong. I'll send it back inside. Thank you, Sean. Durham Regional Police have identified a suspect arrested in connection with a pair of stabbings in Oshawa. Police were called to the area of King Street West and Stevenson Road shortly after 3 a.m. on Saturday for reports of a man being stabbed aboard Durham Region Transit bus. Police say the suspect approached the passenger and stabbed him twice before leaving the bus. He was arrested a short time later. The victim suffered non-life-threatening injuries. Police say they believe the same suspect was involved in a similar incident on Sunday, March 3rd, which saw an elderly man assaulted aboard a bus. 29-year-old Corey Vascamp is facing a number of charges, including assault with weapon in connection with the incidents. A frightening scene on the 400 early this morning. Thankfully, no injuries were reported. Dash cam video shows an SUV colliding with a transport truck, which ended up on the opposite side of the highway and in a ditch. A dump truck, which swerved to avoid the transport truck, jumped the guardrail and also ended up in a ditch. OPP provided an update on the situation earlier. Look where you are. It was still dark at the time. You know, trying to avoid these situations in the first place. It is a little darker in the mornings uh, now with one less hour of sunlight. But with no excuse. Uh, you know, you've got your headlights on. Know where you are. Share the road, shoulder check, and if you're, if you're involved in a collision, move off the highway safely uh, and obviously not in front of the path of a moving uh, transport truck because uh, this could have ended much worse. Police say a 41-year-old has been charged with careless driving in connection with the crash. The highway in the area has been fully reopened. Still to come, Haiti's Prime Minister says he will resign amid continued violence. We'll have more on the efforts to restore peace in the Caribbean nation a little later in the show. The city of Markham and the federal government announced an agreement today to fast-track the construction of over 1,600 housing units over the next three years. It's about coming together as a society to build more homes and to build them faster right here in Markham. The deal under the Housing Accelerator Fund will provide nearly $59 million to eliminate barriers in order to build the units. The city also announced their own plans to build more than 6,000 homes over the next decade. We want all of our families to be able to live in this community. They should not have to go elsewhere. It's a, it's a sad comment when, when uh, young people in, in our community have to go 100, 150, maybe 200 kilometers away to begin to be able to afford a, a home. They should be able to do that uh, within our community. We should be able to provide that range of, of housing within our community. The Housing Accelerator Fund aims to build at least 100,000 new homes across Canada over the next three years. Officials in Huntsville say they're investigating a cyber attack which forced its town hall and library to close on Monday. The town of Huntsville says it learned of the attack over the weekend and a team of cybersecurity specialists are now trying to figure out which systems have been impacted. Officials say all March break programs are running as scheduled, including the Algonquin Theatre Camp. More news in a moment, but first, here's a live look at the city tonight. It was a sunny day today, and it's expected to be even sunnier tomorrow. Speaking of sunshine, here's Jessica Smith with a look <laughs> at the current conditions. Jess. It was a beautiful kind of way to settle into the March break. That So many folks are often enjoying this really beautiful forecast. It gets even warmer into the day tomorrow, some areas into that kind of 20-degree range. For us here in the city, likely closer to 17 or 18, but by a degree or two, it's not too bad, all things considered, and we remain dry for now. Temperature-wise, we're still pretty mild in Windsor sitting at 18. We're at 14 through Hamilton, 11 in Peterborough, Ottawa still sitting at 10. And it remains a really kind of nice night as far as the wind direction goes, really quite light. Still sunny out there. That sunset now after 7 p.m. We're looking at sunshine through the island, 9 degrees right now. Through Pearson, about 12 tonight, dropping down to 4, so into the single digits, but that is still 
well above seasonal. Coming up, I'll have a full look at your long range forecast, including the heat on the way tomorrow and the cool down on the way as we officially welcome in the astronomical spring season next week. But right now, send things back over to Nathan and Andrea. Thank you, Jessica. Ottawa is spending over $2.1 million to address the overrepresentation of Indigenous people in Canada's justice system. The statistical overrepresentation of First Nations, Inuit, and Metis people in the criminal justice system is plainly shocking. We're talking about a factor of six to tenfold. Uh, and the statistics that Julie outlined are actually even worse when we talk about Indigenous youth populations. The cause of that over overrepresentation in our justice system must be addressed. And what we are doing as a government is we are showing our dedication to doing exactly just that. The money will support a criminal diversion program for Indigenous low risk offenders in Toronto. It will reflect traditional Indigenous approaches to the administration of justice. Funding will also go to Aboriginal legal services for the preparation of pre sentencing reports and to support a needs assessment of Toronto's courthouse and bail centre. A key focus will be ensuring greater input from First Nations, Inuit, and Metis people. A probe is being launched into how Canada's justice system treats victims of sexual assault. Benjamin Roebuck, who is the federal ombudsman for victims of crime, says victims' rights are often ignored and that survivors say the system makes them feel unsafe. He says the idea that survivors will have a painful experience navigating the justice system has become normalized. As the federal ombudsperson for victims of crime, our office provides special advice to the Minister of Justice directly uh, and to Parliament, and we appear at parliamentary committees and advise on legislation. So our hope is that we can identify really concrete and clear actions to improve things for survivors, and that we can uh, present that to the government and then request a government response and follow up to see that actions are being uh, implemented. Public consultations will be launched in the spring, followed by an expert advisory panel who will analyze those results and come up with concrete solutions. LCBO employees held a day of action across the province today. They gathered outside of MPP offices to deliver petitions ahead of their upcoming round of bargaining. CTV's Beth McDonnell has been following this story and joins us live with more. Beth. Nathan, the union representing workers says the LCBO puts $2.5 billion of profits into public services every year. And today, that action that the workers held was to make sure it stays that way. Preventing privatization. It's a fight these LCBO workers feel is right in front of them. Our members are ready. We're telling Doug Ford that we will not allow the sell-off and peace-off of the LCBO. To make their point, OPSU, the union representing employees, held protests outside 11 MPP offices around the province, including Premier Doug Ford's office in Etobicoke. Here, they delivered 7,000 petitions to support the Crown Corporation staying government-owned. Those are our profits, not grocery store CEOs not big box locations. These are our profits, Ontario's profits. You and I own the LCBO. In December, the government announced up to 8,500 new stores will be allowed to sell alcohol by 2026. While union workers are concerned about the impact and possible job losses, the Convenience Industry Council of Canada is expecting to see 3,500 jobs created. It says expanding alcohol sales is not the beginning of the end for the LCBO. Absolutely not. I mean, I think, you know, we look at, you know, the typical Ontarian um, they're just going to have more choice in terms of places that they can go. There's still going to be a much more expanded product offering. No convenience store, just as most Ontarians don't do their all of their grocery shopping at their local convenience store, nor are they going to do all of their beverage alcohol shopping at their local convenience store. We will not be privatizing the LCBO, the finance minister's office said in a statement. The LCBO will continue to be a publicly owned retailer, providing choice and convenience for consumers, as well as operating as the exclusive wholesaler for all retail, bars and restaurants selling alcohol and spirits. Consumers we spoke with for the most part agree with the LCBO staying in public hands. I don't think it's a good idea. Addictions, addictions never been higher since COVID should be accessible more, more convenient for everybody. You usually have to travel to one place. I have no problems with it. I kind of don't mind knowing that the LCBO is there. I'll go grab alcohol if I need to. Once they go private, the prices go up. 
for, for everything. Uh, Calgary did it, and all their all their prices have gone up. Um, Quebec, they still have their LCBO, hasn't changed. The demonstrations come as union members begin the next round of bargaining with the LCBO. Gas stations and big box stores are part of the alcohol sale expansion. The Convenience Industry Council of Canada says details still need to be worked out on pricing, but consumers aren't that likely to pay much more for convenience. Reporting live, I'm Beth McDonnell. Nathan, back to you. Thank you, Beth. Still to come, empowering girls through basketball. Some local kids got a chance to hit the court with a WNBA star. Canada says military intervention offers the best chance of restoring order to Haiti, where violent gangs have thrown the country into chaos. Otto is also welcoming today's announcement that Haiti's prime minister will resign following months of international pressure. CTV Genevieve Beauchemin reports. With violence and chaos reigning in Haiti, embattled Prime Minister Ariel Henry announced he would step down, leaving the post he's held since 2021, since the former president's assassination. This in a late-night video address from exile. Haiti besoin la paix. He said the country Haiti needed peace and asked Haitians to remain calm. We acknowledge the resignation of Prime Minister Ariel Henry. At the closing conference of a high-level meeting on Haiti's progress, leaders said a transition council would be appointed along with an interim prime minister. This just a few hours after a telephone meeting between Henri and Canada's prime minister, Justin Trudeau. Foreign Affairs Minister Mélanie Joly issued a statement today saying Canada welcomed the news of a political agreement among Haitian stakeholders. As heavily armed gangs tightened their grip on the country, fear of an all-out civil war mount. Canada has warned citizens in the country to shelter in place. The threat of widespread famine, water running out, and an epidemic continues to rise. Food is depleting fast. So I don't know what will happen for the next uh, two weeks in terms of food, but also in terms of medication. Quebec's large Haitian diaspora is growing increasingly concerned about the situation on the ground. And people talking, you know, calling the family here and saying, Please, please help us. So this is how we feel. Our heart in Haiti and our body in Canada. Leaders in Montreal called for the Canadian government to take on a leadership role to ensure Haitian people are at the heart of political decisions. A contingent of a thousand police officers from Kenya was expected to head to the country, but that deal is now on hold until there's a new temporary government in place. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. In Lebanon, airstrikes killed at least two people and wounded 20 others. One of the strikes destroyed a warehouse that reportedly was used to store food. The Israeli military says its attacks hit two Hezbollah sites and were in response to rocket attacks over northern Israel earlier in the day. The militant group says it launched a barrage of 100 rockets striking Israeli military positions. There have been exchanges almost every day along the border since the war between Israel and Hamas began. Fighting continues to rage in the Gaza Strip, where over 30,000 people have been killed and the humanitarian crisis worsens. Today, an aid ship loaded with about 200 tons of food left Cyprus for the Palestinian territory. It is part of a pilot project that would see the opening of a sea corridor to Gaza, where hundreds of thousands are on the brink of starvation. The food on the vessel was collected by the charity World Central Kitchen and is being transported by the Spanish aid group Open Arms. It is expected to arrive in a couple days. Russia is taking part in joint naval drills with Iran and China in the Gulf of Oman. The Russian military reports over 20 ships, support vessels, combat boats, and naval helicopters from Russia, Iran, and China are taking part in the Marine Security Belt 2024 naval exercise. They say the drills are aimed at improving the safety of maritime economic activity. This is the fourth drill held between the three countries since 2019. We already know that Joe Biden and Donald Trump are poised for a rematch in November, and tonight that could become official. Voters are casting their ballots in Georgia, one of four states and a territory holding nominating contests today. Trump is the only Republican candidate left, and Biden faces no significant challenge on the Democratic side. So both men could clinch their party's presidential nominations tonight if they earn the necessary delegates to reach the 50 percent national threshold. 
At least 50 passengers aboard a flight to New Zealand suffered minor injuries after the Boeing plane they were on suddenly dropped mid-flight. We dropped and it happened in a split second and then suddenly um, all the devices and bags were up near the roof. A passenger shared their photo showing the immediate aftermath of the incident. The Chilean flight plunged 150 meters before the crew regained control. The cause of the drop is still under investigation, but the airline has described the incident as a technical event. The investigation will go through each possible alternative. So they'll eliminate things that could not have caused it. One of the first things that they'll investigate are the weather conditions. Were they in clear air? Could it have been a clear air turbulence upset? Could it have been some malfunction with the autopilot? Uh, did a pilot get up to go to the restroom and accidentally fall against the controls when they hit a bump? Uh, these are the things that they'll investigate. More than a dozen people were taken to hospital after the plane landed, though only two needed treatment. Four astronauts have returned safely from the International Space Station. NASA SpaceX Crew 7 splashed down off the coast of Florida shortly before 6 a.m. The three astronauts and one Russian cosmonaut spent nearly six months in orbit. A new crew arrived at the space station a week ago. Still to come, a prescribed burn will be conducted in High Park later this month. It's all part of an effort to protect the city's rare black oak savannas. And I'm Pat Foran. Coming up on Consumer Alert, if you're looking to rent a house, apartment, or condo, be careful you don't get scammed. In a tight rental market, more people are trying to find a place to live, and scammers are taking out fake ads, ripping people off. I'll have that story just ahead. The fantastic spring weather continues as we head throughout our evening. So if you're getting out for a walk tonight, still in the double digits right through to about 11 p.m. Coming up, I'll have a full look at your long range forecast, including even warmer weather on the way as we head into the middle of the week. And stay with us. We've got another full night of great shows for you right here on CTV. A report on rental listings found the average price of a one-bedroom apartment in Toronto is now $2,500 per month. It's Fraud Prevention Month, and you should know rental scams are currently a major problem if you're searching for a place to live. Here's Pat Foran and Consumer Alert. Pat. Nathan and Andrea, trying to find a place to rent in the GTA is difficult, and many units are also very expensive. Scammers are taking advantage of the situation, creating fake ads and ripping people off. I wanted it so bad, so I was telling myself and my parents, just like, we have to trust it. Jenna Mercer felt it was time to move out of her parents' Georgetown home and was pleased to find a basement apartment she could afford. He was telling me he was sending his house keys through the mail to me, so I'm like, that's a, that's a big thing to do. But the keys never arrived. She was scammed out of $780. I guess I was definitely too trusting. It's really annoying because I need to look for something else. And I was like, I thought I had something sorted and I didn't. David Grad just moved from Ireland to Toronto and thought he had secured a place to rent. But when he showed up at the address, someone else was living there. He was scammed out of $3,600. I 100% knew that it was it was kind of a scam when I went there on Monday and it was obviously a fake ad. Both ads were placed on rentals.ca, a website that's free to use, connecting landlords and tenants. The company says it's doing what it can to limit fraud. If you do contact a landlord and they want to request that you send payment right away, that's a red flag. You want to make sure that you at least meet the landlord or tour the property. The website is now using a verification program for landlords. If they agree to be pre-screened, they will have a blue check mark beside their listing. We really want to make sure that the verified listing program is not only something landlords are using, but renters are looking out for as well. Tenant advocates say because rents are high and units are limited, renters must be on guard against fraud no matter which website they use. Whenever you have a tight rental market, um, people are going to be desperate. And whenever you get people that are desperate, um, they're going to be prone to scams. And you should also be leery of rental prices much lower than market rents or what the landlord says throughout the country. And if you have to pay in advance to secure a unit, only do so after meeting the landlord and touring the property. On your side, I'm Pat Foran.
If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. Well, spring has not arrived just yet, but it felt like it today. <laughs> just great conditions to be outside enjoying the weather. Absolutely. Yesterday, I had trouble with the word skylight, yeah. but today I actually went outside and enjoyed the sun, so it was fantastic. It really was a beautiful day. We're kind of in that, that back and forth where we see these really warm weeks, and then as we head in towards the official start of the spring season, the astronomical start, it's always just fun to say astronomical and meteorological, uh, the astronomical start begins next week. It does cool down pretty significantly, so get out over the next few days and enjoy Enjoy the warmth. Weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. Now, it's feeling a little, I don't want to say summer-like, but I saw folks out there in t-shirts, maybe shorts as you head into the day tomorrow, but it is mild. And then some. This trend really hasn't changed at all since we've kind of settled into the beginning of the spring season. We're at 18 through Windsor right now, 12 in the city of Toronto. Sudbury is at 8. I know a lot of folks are traveling around Ontario throughout the March break week. So it's a great forecast to do so. Tonight, pretty mild. We'll be at four. We should be at minus five. Everybody holding on to the warmth as we head through this evening and into the day tomorrow. We'll be up to 17. We should be at four. The the temperatures are, are nearing record-breaking once again. We broke a few records in northern Ontario yesterday. We'll keep a close eye on today, but tomorrow it is going to be dare I say, t-shirt weather. Now heading in towards the day tomorrow, we are looking at a few lows tracking through, but realistically, they stay far north. High pressure sitting just south of us will keep us nice and clear throughout the day tomorrow. Ahead, though, of some active weather on the way is going to be cloud cover first as we kind of head into the second half of our Thursday. But timing everything out as we head through the rest of our day today, not too bad, right? A few light clouds out there tomorrow. You'll need your sunglasses and maybe a little sunscreen if you're going to spend some time outdoors. And then as we head into Thursday, we see some cloud cover start to roll in. And then the first round of active weather starts towards Windsor. For us here in the GTA, this is more of a Thursday night situation and it carries us into our Friday. But temperature wise, we do a pretty drastic shift between today and in towards next week. We're looking at 17 as we head into our Wednesday, Thursday, very mild as well. Those overnight lows well above the seasonal norm. After the rain rolls through, as we get in towards our Friday and Saturday, a little cooler. It's warm adjacent, I like to call it, but we're not cooling down significantly until we get in towards the beginning of next week. So as you kind of wrap up March break for many, we head through our Saturday and Sunday, quite mild, uh, still in the single digits, but above norm. As we get in towards our Sunday for St. Patrick's Day, if you're celebrating, if you're not celebrating, it's just a Sunday for you. Uh, temperature wise, it's not too bad throughout the day. It gets pretty cold though in the evening. Getting in towards next week and the astronomical start of the spring season, pretty seasonal, but so much cooler than we've seen as of late. So the yo-yo the continues with our temperatures as we head throughout the month of March. Andrea. Thanks, Jess. Thanks. The city will conduct a prescribed burn in High Park later this month to help protect its rare black oak savannas. A prescribed burn is a controlled fire which consumes dried leaves, twigs and grass stems, but does not harm larger trees. The exact date will be chosen 24 to 48 hours in advance based on the best weather conditions. High Park will be closed to vehicles on the day of the burn and some areas will be restricted. The city has been using prescribed burns in the park for more than two decades. Girls from across the city got to hit the court with a WNBA star. It was all part of an event aimed at improving their skills on the court and inspiring confidence off it. CTV's Mike Walker has the details. From dribbling to footwork drills and sinking baskets, it's a unique opportunity to learn from a WNBA star. For me, representation matters. So I love being out here and being able to show them that I tie my shoes the same way that they do. And I grew up down the street and got to where I am today and just be an opportunity for them to continue to grow. WNBA All-Star and Canadian Olympian Kia Nurse putting these young players through drills and hoping to inspire them at the same time at a special camp for girls hosted by Tangerine Bank and the Toronto Raptors at the OVO Athletic Centre. Being confident, being a leader, being able to use my voice, being able to work as a team and I think the confidence is the major thing that I've taken from basketball and put into my life and um, you know at the end of the day sport is an opportunity for you to learn all of these things. Basketball is usually like a, like a guy sport you know so it's nice to see like a lot of other girls. Being able to practice on the same court as the Raptors is a big deal for these young players but even bigger is the opportunity to meet and learn from Nurse. It means a lot because it just like kind of gives me hope about like what I could be. She's just an inspirational person like uh, being able from Canada just like me. 
More than 100 girls ages 8 to 16 from organizations across the Toronto area were invited to this community gym initiative that focuses on building skills, teamwork, and boosting self-confidence. This time you have eight seconds. Seven! An all-women coaching staff helping nurse lead the clinic in celebration of International Women's Day. These are our future leaders, so events like these are really important so that we can carve out space for them, so they can see their role models. Confidence is huge for young women. Um, you have to see it to believe it. The drill is not only designed for the court, but to help these girls build skills for their future. To support them on and off the court so that they can create a better lives for themselves, for the future, and for breaking down barriers. An initiative started 10 years ago, empowering these girls to be leaders on and off the court. I'm really excited because I get to meet people new and I get to like learn and work on my skills. It shows them that they matter and that their confidence matters. And to pursue their goals. Mike Walker, CTV News, Toronto. Toronto holds the attendance record for a women's hockey game, but we may lose that title. Hmm. Work her way in close. Off to go around, wrap around, stop. She scores! Last month, Toronto and Montreal faced off at Scotiabank Arena with a sold-out crowd of over 19,200 on hand. But that record may be broken on April 20th. The PWHL game between the top two clubs is going to be played at the Bell Centre, the home of the Montreal Canadiens. It holds more than 21,000 spectators. So a sellout would set a new record. Still to come, rising food costs are creating challenges for student nutrition programs across the province. Now program organizers are calling for additional funding from the province. Ontario student nutrition programs are facing challenges in the wake of rising food costs and increased demand. Program representatives are urging the province to double their funding. They say many regions now have wait lists of schools wanting to participate in the programs. The Ford government put an additional $6.15 million into the programs this year. However, those were one-time investments, and the people who operate the programs say what's needed is a stable and predictable boost to core funding. Right now, there is a total of $32.1 million put in, $32.2 million put in annually to the Ontario Student Nutrition and the First Nation Student, Student Nutrition Program. Now, that base rate has stayed the same. So it hasn't had a substantial core increase in about a decade since 2014. And so we're really feeling strained because of these, these issues. Um, we did see, though, uh, the Ontario government res respond to the, the challenges and put $6.1 million as a one-time in investment in 2023, which was great. Um, and we really hope it's a great first step towards a more sustainable investment in the next uh, provincial budget. Meanwhile, a spokesperson for Community, Children and Social Services Minister Michael Parsa says he's awaiting more details on a federal pledge to build a Canada-wide student nutrition program. Measles cases have spiked in the U.S. and U.K. recently, and Canadian provinces are also reporting more cases of the virus. Infectious disease specialist Dr. Isaac Bogosh spoke about how to limit the spread of the virus. We just have to be up to date on our measles vaccines. It's as simple as that. The vaccine is very safe. It's extremely effective. Of course, in medicine, just like in life, just like in life nothing's 100% perfect, but it's really, really effective at preventing infection. And, uh, and I think it's just important to check your vaccine card to make sure we're up to date so that uh, we, we don't see any more cases in Canada. We will import cases. That's inevitable. The key is if when we do import cases that we don't see subsequent transmission within the country. There have been nearly two dozen confirmed cases of measles reported in Canada so far this year. That's up from just 12 in all of 2023. Toronto and Canada have some excellent services available for people with cancer, but many struggle to access them. Now, one partnership is working to make sure everyone gets the care they need. CTV health reporter Pauline Chan has the details. Venetia Ramasamy's parents came to Canada speaking only Tamil, but she was able to get a cancer diagnosis mainly because of her grade 11 teacher. But she called my parents to say, go to the doctor, get her an x-ray. 
don't leave without that. Venetia went through treatment for bone cancer. Then at age 19, she developed lung cancer and later on other health issues. Her parents learned English to help her in her medical journey, but the barriers that hindered her initial diagnosis and treatment were still there. We know something is wrong, but trying to advocate for that, to be heard, to not be dismissed, um, to not be gaslit is like a really difficult uh, theme of my journey and it's resulted in poor outcomes. Financial resources, the cultural understanding, the ability to take time off work, transportation to care services, all of these create numerous barriers for some women more than others. Dr. Ambreen Sayani is the principal investigator for the Improving Cancer Care Equity Research Program at Women's College Hospital. I like to think of accessibility in terms of five A's. So is it approachable, meaning people know that there are services that they can access? Is it acceptable to them culturally and linguistically? Is it affordable to them? Is it available at a time that suits their needs and priorities? And is it appropriate, meaning does it meet their needs? Venetia recalls how her parents could not afford the transportation for her to get downtown for rehab. And that language was a problem not only for communicating, but to be seen as credible. It almost feels impossible sometimes to be heard. Um, and, and that's for someone like me that's already doing patient partner work. Almost 40% of, of the population has a first language that isn't English and isn't French. Up to 40% of the population was born outside Canada and almost 15% of the population is living with low income. Still, things are slowly changing. Last year was the first time Venetia met a doctor who could speak her native Tamil. And research at Women's College is listening to the experiences of people like her to reduce disparities. I really want to be a face for people that are um, really suffering out there and deserve better care, um, early diagnoses, um, optimal treatments. Pauline Chan, CTV News. The U.S. has expanded testing of international travelers for COVID-19 and other infectious diseases. People arriving from South Africa, like that, South America, Africa, and Asia, are receiving a no swab. They're being asked questions about their travel and any potential infections. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention has added Chicago and Miami, expanding the program to six airports. Eric Carmen, the former lead singer of the Raspberries, has died. Carmen was best known for his solo hits, Hungry Eyes, and All By Myself. No, I won't sing it. According to his website, the 74-year-old died in his sleep over the weekend. Reruns and tequila. There were times I just better call. Utter Jimmy Buffett is set to take place next month in Los Angeles. The event, titled Keep the Party Going, a tribute to Jimmy Buffett, will feature some notable names, including Paul McCartney, The Eagles, Sheryl Crow, and Pitbull. The concert is set to take place April 11th at the Hollywood Bowl in L.A. Tickets will go on sale this Friday at 10 a.m. Buffett died in September following a battle with skin cancer. It appears big box office hits like Barbie and Oppenheimer provided a ratings boost for the Oscars. An estimated 19 and a half million people tuned in to Sunday night's broadcast of the 96th Academy Awards. That's the most viewers the telecast has received in four years and is up 4% compared to last year's estimated audience. Viewership peaked in the final half hour when Ryan Gosling performed I'm Just Ken and some of the biggest awards of the night were handed out. This year, the Academy also experimented by scheduling the broadcast an hour earlier. On the next CP24 Breakfast. Maestro Fresh Wes's pioneering career continues to be celebrated and will connect or reconnect with a hip hop legend on the next CP24 Breakfast. It's up first at 5.30. This community has gone through so much trauma over the last uh, many years since Regent Park has been here, and I thought, you know, we were beyond this. Updating our top stories: two men and a two men are dead, and a woman is in a hospital following the shooting near Regent Park. Two police officers were also in hospital after being injured in a foot pursuit following the shooting. One person has been taken into custody. So far, there's been no word on any charges.
My heart number one aches for Alice, and that's where all my thoughts are. An elderly woman named Alice Cred is one of two people killed in an early morning house fire in Mississauga. Two other people were also injured. The Ontario Fire Marshal's office says a lack of working smoke alarms contributed to the deadly nature of the fire. We're here today to protect the $2.5 billion in profit that we give back to the provincial treasury every year. LCBO employees held a day of action at MPP offices in 11 Ontario cities today. Workers are expressing their concern about job losses ahead of an upcoming round of bargaining with the province. Remember to keep up to date day and night through our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca, and by downloading the CTV News app. And if you have a news tip, photos, or video of breaking news, let us know. In business, investors hoping for a cooler inflation got a rude awakening today with the economic data out of the U.S. With more, here's Amber Kanwar from BNM Bloomberg. Inflation in the United States unexpectedly picked up for the month of February in America. Prices increased 3.2 percent, defying expectations that inflation would cool from last month. This comes as investors have been hoping that cooler inflation would bring interest rate cuts. However, the market shook off the hotter inflation read and managed to gain on enthusiasm for artificial intelligence. The S&P 500 closed at a record high for a 17th time this year, while the TSX closed at a 23-month high. Now here's a look at the market numbers. The Canadian dollar hanging in around 74 cents U.S. It was a down day for crude oil south of the border, falling to $77 per barrel, while Canadian oil prices were also lower to $62 per barrel. The TSX managed to finish higher, up nearly 62 points. That's the latest in business. I'm Amber Canwar in the BNN Bloomberg Newsroom. The Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. The future of Atlantic Canada's largest newspaper company remains uncertain. Insolvency proceedings are underway against Saltwire Network, claiming it owes tens of millions of dollars following years of mismanagement. Fiera Private Debt Fund says Saltwire and the Halifax Herald Limited owe almost $33 million, plus nearly $600,000 in interest. Saltwire owns the Chronicle Herald in Halifax, the Telegram in St. John's, and the Guardian in Charlottetown. Documents accuse the company of mismanaging the business and misusing employee pension funds. Saltwire has applied for creditor protection, saying operations will continue as normal. Food prices remain on the rise nationwide, even with discount prices ticking upwards. Sylvain Charlevoix, director of the Agri-Food Analytics Lab at Dalhousie University, offered his thoughts on the increases. Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised, to be honest. These are branded products. So what really happened uh, recently is that uh, grocers uh, actually increase fees because to do business with grocers, you have to pay them. That's really what's different in the food business. And so companies uh, with national brands like Pepsi, Mondelez, Nestle raised prices to offset the impact of higher fees. And that's the rat race that is impacting all of us, which is why we've been talking about the code of conduct. So this rat race ceases as soon as possible. Charlevoix says February has historically been one of the most volatile months for food prices. The U.S. is bringing in new rules for labeling meat, poultry, and eggs. By 2026, only products from animals born, raised, slaughtered, and processed in the U.S. will be able to use the Made in U.S. label. For years, American ranchers have argued that use of the voluntary label by companies who raised animals abroad and only processed them in the U.S. was misleading and created a disadvantage for domestic producers. There are some concerns in Canada the new rules could disrupt supply chains. Still to come, lighting up the waterfront. Interactive light displays have taken over Trillium Park as part of an arts festival running through to next month. Tonight, renewed turbulence for Boeing planes. And then I looked up to see the gentleman that was sitting next to me on the roof of the plane. Passenger concerns pile up and an investigation into safety problems later on CTV National News. Interactive light installations have taken over Trillium Park. 
Lumiere, the Art of Light features a number of installations as well as interactive experiences and even bonfires on certain nights. The event is taking place at the Waterfront Park near Ontario Place from sunset to 11 at night. These sculptures are made with a polyurethane resin mixed with a pigment which is um, actually reacts to uh, infrared lighting. So I have light embedded within them, but uh, it would uh, work with black lighting as well. I guess I do have like an emotional attachment to this work as well. Um, it was very painstaking of an undertaking for me. Uh, a lot went into this work and having like the community come out to engage with it is actually something that's like really amazing, really intriguing to me is having all sorts of people come out here and be able to take what they will from it. It's not just my work anymore. Now it belongs to the public as well. The art festival is free to attend and runs until April 20th in Trillium Park. I like that. It's free. Absolutely. Yes. Free. If it's free, it's for me. That's my motto. <laughs> <laughs> food, food is better when it's free. Clothes fit better when they're free. And it's also nice that the forecast for you guys is free to an extent. Uh, it is nice outside high pressure. The strong ridge of high pressure really keeps us clear today, tomorrow, the start of Thursday. Get out and enjoy it if you can. We're at 18 through Windsor, 12 still here in the city. It is going to be a beautiful day today, rest of the day today and the day <laughs> tomorrow too. Lots of sunshine. Get out, enjoy it. It is going to be warm and above seasonal. We do have a cool down coming, but I'm focusing on the positive, and that yeah. is the near 20 degree temperatures into our Wednesday. I'll send things back to you guys. Thank, Thank you, Jess. Be sure to join Omar Sachedina tonight at 11 for CTV National News, followed by Natalie Johnson with our next local newscast at 11.30. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Jessica Smith and all of us at CTV News, thank you for watching and have a good night. Good night.